Okay, welcome to World History. This is Chapter 1, Section 1. Now, these videos can be helpful for students who were maybe absent from my class uh, or maybe want to do extra review from the lectures that I do in person. Or also, this could be helpful for students who are taking world history at a different school who might want to get a little bit of extra information or an alternative viewpoint. But it could also be great for teachers or parents who want to either develop a, a lesson plan schedule or use some of these notes uh, to help their own students or own learners at home. And one of the things I would say is that for every video lesson that I make, I have a lesson plan up on the screen that I will take you through. Um, most of them I won't go through, like the prior knowledge, the overview, the, the sort of teacher elements, uh, but it will be there on the screen. And if you wanted to get access to those, you could either subscribe to my YouTube page or email me at mlangle at stmarysprep.com. Now, for today's purposes, I'm going to show you how sort of my lesson plans are made. Obviously, I use the Madeline Hunter style. I'll have the objective, the prior knowledge that students would need to be successful here, the basic overview of what this section would be, the objectives, what students should be able to do after this lesson. I write down the preparation, what I would do in class on the board. I have usually a anticipatory set to get students warmed up into the lesson. These are things that I would do in the in-person class structure. Uh, here, I'm just going to focus on the input modeling, the, I guess you could say, the bulk of the material that I would like to teach to, to the students through the detail. I use the outline format, so I use Roman numerals and capital letters, and this is all predicated on the textbook World History Patterns of Interaction, which I'll be bouncing back and forth to to give examples or show pictures or graphs maps, what have you. So this is how I'm going to basically operate um, with making these video lessons throughout this year. I will have a video lesson from chapter one through chapter 36. Uh, so we'll cover the entire textbook and we'll cover all the way from 8000 BC with human origins through the Paleolithic, through the Neolithic times, then going into Sumer, Egypt, Katal Hayuk, uh, ancient India, ancient China, moving our way through, through the Middle Ages, and then of course culminating with the, the World War II and then the modern world. Okay, let's get started today is chapter one, section one. And here is the lesson, Roman numeral one states, this is an introduction to the study of human origins. Basically, what we're talking about is how we learn about early humans, human origins, where they come from, what are some of the things that they did. A lot of this is predicated on what we call, capital letter A, prehistory. It dates back to before the invention of writing, which took place roughly 5,000 years ago. Um, basically, we could translate that to 3,000 BC, roughly in that area. The first true writing that we have a lot of detail on is cuneiform, which was developed by the Sumerians in the region of Mesopotamia. We also learn about early humans through artifacts, capital letter B. These are human-made objects such as tools and jewelry. We learn a great deal about the type of tools that they used, uh, what they could fashion out of those tools. We may not have all the evidence there, but artifacts are really, when you're talking about prehistory, a, a key roadmap to understanding. There are certain scientists and, and other uh, practitioners that study these type of things. I'm going to go over those briefly. Archaeologists are uh, people who excavate and dig in search of clues to the prehistoric way of life. So they're searching for artifacts. Capital D, paleontologists generally study fossils or evidence of early life preserved in rocks. And then anthropologists generally study culture. Um, for this class, we will, we will refer to those in the first few chapters. Paleontologists we don't really focus on them too much in the class. That doesn't come up all that much. Uh, when you're talking about fossils, you, you're usually talking about other species, but you know, there are some, there's some evidence there. Roman numeral two, we're gonna move into the understanding of culture. Culture by definition is a people's unique way of life. It focuses on the shared traits or the common practices that people exhibit. Capital B says the components of culture there's three components of culture that we generally accept. Number one, common practices. Number two, shared understandings. 
And third would be social organization. I'm going to use the textbook to show you some examples here, which can be found on page six. Here are the components of culture. We see common practices are things like what people eat, clothing that they wear, the sports that they enjoy, so on and so forth. The shared understandings are things like language, symbolism, religious beliefs, values. Uh, for example, a symbol of United American culture would be either the bald eagle or the American flag. Um, social organization would be family, um, if there's a class or caste structure within the cultural practices, government style, how people view authority, so on and, and so forth. Let's bounce back to the lecture here. There's really two ways that we in history generally talk about how culture is learned. The first one is observe and imitate. It's kind of like monkey see, monkey do. If you ever heard that one, you know, I have, I have children and a lot of times they want to do what their parents are doing. Like if I'm out cutting the grass, they want to have the plastic lawnmower and, and act like they're doing what I'm doing. And so you kind of can observe and then imitate cultural practices. Number two is direct teaching through spoken or written language. What I like to tell my students here is you can kind of envision the ancient campfire where there's a town, there's a, an elder or a, a tribal elder that's kind of disseminating information about the tribe and, and what certain practices they, uh, they believe in and, and why they hunt and, and how they hunt and what the necessity of the animal spirits would be, so on and so forth. So direct teaching is kind of what I'm doing right now. I'm speaking directly and trying to teach information. Now, the next part of the lesson talks about hominids and the different uh, types of hominids that were around th throughout the course of history. Now, hominids are humans and also other creatures that walk upright. One of the oldest found hominid is the Australopithecine. Australopithecine is a hominid that was found in Eastern and Southern Africa about 4 million years ago. This is rough estimate of when they were were alive and when they were, were uh, thriving. They, they are the oldest or the first human-like creature to walk upright that we have evidence of. And one of the key idea, ideas that we've discovered about Australopithecine is they had the opposable thumb, meaning their thumb could cross over and touch the digits of their finger or hand, I'm sorry. Capital letter C is going to be uh, Homo habilis, which means man of skill. Homo habilis was found in East Africa around 3 million years ago. They were the first to make stone tools. Now, most of the early stone tools that we found were made out of lava rock. And these tools were generally used for basic practices like cutting meat, cracking open bones for the marrow, and to make tools, so on and so forth, out of wood. Next is capital D, Homo erectus, which means upright man. They were discovered remains in Africa, Asia, and Europe roughly two million years ago. Homo erectus is one of the first to use significant technology or ways of applying knowledge, tools, and invention to meet human need. Basically, it makes human life more feasible and easier through tools, weapons, so on and so forth. Number three, they use tools for hunting, scraping, digging, and cutting, for example. They are known to be the first to migrate or move out of Africa. They settled in places like Europe, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, China even, as far as India. They were the first known species to use fire and may have developed language. One of the reasons that we think Homo erectus may have developed language is to be able to migrate and navigate. You're probably working in tribal groups of maybe 15 to 50 people. And so to be able to do that, there has to be some type of language that would develop to plan team hunts and things of that nature. Also, we have the Neanderthal. Neanderthal was uh, found in Europe and Southwest Asia within one million years. So within the past million years, they had a little bit more of a powerful build. They had heavy slanted brows. Uh, they generally had more developed muscles than the other groups of hominids and very thick bones by what we've discovered. One of the cool things about Neanderthal is a lot of people think of the quintessential caveman, but in fact, we find through studying that they actually weren't so hoo hoo ha uh, ha, uh, and uh, they were one of the first to have known religious practices and beliefs. They practiced human burial. Um, archaeologists actually have found 
bodies covered with flowers um, from about 60,000 years ago in Shanadar Cave, which is located in northeast Iraq. The fact that you have flowers on a grave site, if you kind of break that down, it's sort of when you think about a flower, flowers come up in the spring, then they go away, then they return. So what we believe is that the flowers on the cave rep represents the belief in an afterlife or that this person will be reborn in some way, shape or form. Next is point number four. Neanderthal, though, did generally live in caves. Most of these groups did, by the way, or wood shelters. They made shelters out of wood, which would be fortified by animal hides or skins as a cover. Capital letter F is going to talk about Cro-Magnon. Cro-Magnon is actually an early group of Homo sapien, which is mean, meaning wise men. They were from Europe um, roughly 40,000 years ago. If you take a Cro-Magnon and put them in a suit, they're going to look identical to a modern human. The, the, the body and the structure is, is, is identical. They were um, known for superior hunting skills. They would had planned and team hunts, which helped their ability to gain meat and other products. They did definitely have spoken language. To be able to plan out team hunts and communicate and work together, they had to have a language. They also had superior strategies in hunting and language that contributed to Cro-Magnon actually outlasting Neanderthal. So this is a possible reason that may explain why the Neanderthal went extinct. It's due to the fact that Cro-Magnon had a little bit better language, a little bit better communication, and had better hunting skills. Next up, as we move down, is Roman numeral four. We're going to talk about the two major parts of the Stone Age here covered in section one. The first part is called the Paleolithic Age. This is known as the Old Stone Age. Lithic meaning stone, paleo, old. This is from 2.5 million to 8,000 BC. During this time period, we have evidence of the earliest form of stone chopping tools. Capital B moves us into the Neolithic Age. This is also known as the New Stone Age, Neo meaning new, Lithic meaning stone. Uh, 8,000 BC up to 3,000 BC. In 3,000 BC, we have the development of writing. We have some, uh, some other uh, developments that we'll talk about later in the class that get us out of the Neolithic Age and into other ages. Uh, but during this time, we find more polished, more fashioned stone tools. We find evidence of pottery. We have agriculture, so in, in, around 8,000 BC is when we have what's called the Neolithic Revolution, where people start to figure out how to grow plants and domesticate species and also animals. So then they have the higher propensity to settle in one place. If you have a farm and you have a field that you can live off of, not having to move as a hunter-gatherer chasing the game or finding areas that aren't uh, depleted in their sources for gathering, then this is when people start to domesticate plants and animals and settle in one spot. To culminate here, there's three major developments of the Stone Age. When we talk about the Stone Age, we're talking about Paleolithic and Neolithic combined. It's, of course, the use of tools, the mastery of fire for warmth and for, for cooking, and then also the development of language, as we talked about some of the hominids having developed language.